back to our regularly scheduled program. Welcome to my ticket to Lake. What I'm trying to do is something like that. Some simple layers and then some ink work because those are not my favorite colors right there. So we're gonna see what we can do. painted on camera this way anyway so bear with me so I'm gonna fold my piece of paper in half because I'm gonna do two and this is not watercolor paper this is just cardstock so this entire thing is an experiment we'll see it may or may not work because I did not try this ahead of time I did not, and I'm getting, by glomming up like this, I'm getting fingerprints all over this smooth surface. So we might see the watercolor not take there. May I sit with you? Let me share the chair. Okay. <laughs> really? Oh, you're so much fun. Uh, normally I don't tape it, but because I folded it, now it wants to buckle up. So I am going to tape it just only so that my paint doesn't go where I don't want it to. And I'm just using a teeny little bit of masking tape just to keep it flat. I already have added some texture. How beautiful. I'm using a white sable, Robert Simmons. I'm not even sure if you can get these anymore. These brushes are old. Actually, this is a newer one. You can see the watercolor paper wears out you know it's like it's like running something over an emery board all the time there's a lot of tooth and watercolor paper and so eventually uh, they just get worn down you can see the difference but the test is when you wet them and that noise oh i love that noise it's one of the reasons i love watercolor it's water Sounds like the lake. Do they come to a nice point? And as old as it is, it still does. I don't know if you can see how chewed up these ends are. <laughs> I don't even know if I'm on camera. Still perfectly fine brush. What color do I want the back layer to be? It's always good to have some sort of idea going in what you want to do. And I don't. I have no idea. Oh, we'll just do whatever this is. Kind of a greenish, bluish. Now, again, I haven't painted in years. I want to just outline some of these, some of this background with water with clean water. And I can't do too much because this is cardstock. It's just junk paper, so it's not gonna take a whole lot of love. This first layer is just, it's essentially just color. It's not shapes or anything at all. So that's what I'm gonna put in there. Just some color. And watercolor always dries back about 20%, so if it seems a little bright to you, know that it will dry back about 20%. Take some clean water and do the same, essentially the same thing on this side. What I'm making here 
is a front and a back cover for a book. Wherever you have water, your paint will go. Where the water flows, the paint goes. When it hits the edge of the water, it will stop. And that's where you get harsh edges. Sometimes you want harsh, ed harsh edges and sometimes you don't. I just went into my dirty water. It's green water. I'm doing green. It's fine. But when things start getting real messy, I'm going to have to pay closer attention. And I have a dirty brush, so I just want some water. I don't want to mess up my clean water. Also notice that I'm not holding my my brush like a pencil. The closer you hold it down like this, the more you want to get detailed with it and nose to nose with it. When I'm doing a small piece like this, I'm about halfway up the shaft of the brush. If I were doing a quarter size sheet of wall watercolor paper or a full size sheet, a nice big 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 piece. I'm, I usually am standing up and I hold my brush quite a bit farther away because then you're using your whole arm or your wrist or your hand versus your finger. And the tighter you are on it, the more detail you're going to get. So once I start, if I were to get detail, detail, detail down in this, you'd see me switch to a smaller brush. Although this brush, I love these brushes because I can get pretty fine detail work even with a monster like this because this one also has a fantastic point on it. And you notice, well you can't see it probably, but I never ever leave my, my brushes in the water. These are not the most expensive brushes out there, they're not Kalinsky Sable. I don't have the heart to do that. Uh, so all my brushes are synthetic. But they're not cheap either. This huge, it's called Goliath, comes to a super nice point. So if I wanted to, I can get pretty fine lines with this bugger. Not single hair brush detail but pretty fine lines if I wanted to uh, do that. I'm all about economy <laughs> of time and steps. So if I can use one brush for most of the painting, I'm in. The way you test to see if your painting is dry is to put the back of your hand, lots of oil on the front of your hand, put the back of your hand, if it's cool, there's still quite a bit of water in it. Which means, this is damp. If I put my next layer on, it's gonna soften, it's gonna bleed a little bit. And I may want that for that second layer. In fact, I think I'll go ahead and do that. And just, we'll see how that works. So I go in my dirty water, and I clean it off on my thing, and then I go in my clean water, and get to, get to pick out my next color. I love projects like this where I can just clean off my palette and use the paint. I 
I'm going over the green that I already put down, going over part of it and in, in new areas. Not very wet, so it's not going to move very much at all. That's all right. I don't know if you can see that right there. If I go over it, it separates. There's my fingerprints. Lots of oil I put on there. Glom it all up. Handle it like an idiot. Oh, well, good lesson. You don't have to believe me now. You can see there's oil. <laughs> there's another spot. Eventually, sometimes it, it succumbs because you scrub it off, essentially, with your brush. And I'm not going for anything specific just yet. Again, I'm just going for shapes right now. Shapes and blocks of color and a second layer. See right here how nice and harsh those lines are because this is good and dry now. So I'm getting more dry brushed than uh, wet and I want it kind of wet. So we're gonna add some more water and make it move around. Now, a lot of people will hit this with a hairdryer or a heat gun or whatever they have. They'll hit it to dry it fast. And it does work. It dries it fast. But here's what I've never heard anyone share. Uh, it'll stop all the action that we love watercolor for. That movement and that what watercolor does best is is flow into each other and and make these these luminous layers and whatnot and when you when you hit it with heat and you take that water out essentially that's what you're doing is is making that water um evaporate off dry off and if there's no water there's no movement and one of the very best parts of watercolor for me is that movement, is, is how the colors melt together and, and blossom and bloom. And, and if, you, if you put water, put a little bit of water in this now dry paint, it's, it's going to blossom and it's, gonna, it's just going to make these little magical spots and splashes. But if I hit it with a dryer, all that stops. It's dry fast, but it all stops. So it all depends on what you want. If, if you want that magical watercolor movement, let it do its thing. If you want to hurry up and dry it so you can go on to the next layer and that movement doesn't matter, well then by all means. You know, there's a time and a place for all of it. If, if you're doing watercolory stuff like this, I leave the hairdryer alone. But if I'm working in a junk journal and I want to get that dry so I could put on 10 more layers, well, then I'll hit it with my dryer. I just put some water on here. I don't know if you can see, but it's, it's shiny wet. And it is hard, I'll tell you, as a very impatient person. It is very hard to wait. This is cheap paper, it shouldn't take long, but it's gonna take as long as it takes. So what I always do is I have other things going on. I will leave it and go do something else and come back to this when the magic is all done on its own. Because for me, 
that's one of the beauties of watercolor is that intermingling, intermixing stuff that you uh, you will lose a great deal of when you hit it with that dryer. If you hit it too early, once it's dry, I can put any color on top and it'll layer like stained glass. If I put a yellow over all of this, you'll see that green and that blue green through that yellow. That's one of the best parts of watercolor, especially using quality paints, is that they're very transparent. There are some opaque colors by nature. They're just opaque, meaning non-transparent. You can't see through them colors. But for the most part, that's one of the reasons we love watercolor is because of its luminosity, because it just is so bright. Even if it's a, a gray, gloomy watercolor, excuse me, watercolor of rain or, or a rainy day, it just kind of glows. And that's the luminosity, that's the light going through those transparent layers of color, hitting that bright white beautiful paper and coming back out through those colors. Kind of like a stained glass effect. If you're using cheap colors or opaque colors or crappy paper, the fillers muddy all that up. It's like looking through dirty sunglasses. If it's wet when I put those colors on. In fact, there's a, there, that wet spot still there. I'm just going to drop some purple on and it's just going to mix in with those greens and that blue, blue green. And that's all right because that's going to be my next layer is this purpley color. Just because, I don't know, there aren't any super purple plants, but there aren't any blue and yellow ones either like on that book. So we're doing it. We're going for it. It's awfully dry and I, I want it not to be quite so harsh. So we just add a little dirty water. Wish you could hear my snoring crew. They are just a given her. They're snoring their little heads off. Nice chill, chill day here at the Hacienda. It's fading into the background because it's so wet and I don't want it quite that faded. I don't want it harsh either. Somewhere in between, please. One of the reasons I gave up art the first time, I gave art entirely up, just quick cold turkey. Uh, I don't know if I've shared this, my, my mom was an artist. She went to art school right out of high school. And so by the time I came on the scene, there were art supplies everywhere. And I learned one, two, three, ABC, red, yellow, blue. And the rule of thirds from my photography father. And so 
art has always been a part of my life. And when I was in high school, I took every art class or art all the way through, you know, way back when they taught art. That's how old I am. Art was taught in school. <laughs> anyway, I was young, so, you know, bear with me. But if it didn't look like a photograph, if I couldn't tell whether it was a drawing or a picture taken with a camera, I didn't consider it art. I thought the only art was photorealism, hyper photorealism at that. And I learned to paint before I could draw. And so going back and learning how to draw seemed like going back and learning how to crawl once I ran a marathon. It just seemed futile and frustrating and pointless. And so I never did it. Well, you gotta be a pretty good drawer. You have to be able to draw pretty well in order to do photorealistic work. You have to really know perspective and shading and I just want paint. I just want, I just want to paint. So um, I found ways around it, which now in hindsight, I'm kind of frustrated by that because I'm locked into this style. Although I can do pretty realistic work. One of these days I'll dig out my, my uh, albums and show you. But one day I met this fantastic lady. I had given up art altogether. I didn't get rid of my supplies. I, I, uh, packed them away and put them in the attic because I was so frustrated that I could never get I could never get what I wanted in my head out and it just made me crazy and my work was not photorealistic and so to me it wasn't art so I just I just gave it up who needs that irritation so I quit well, I met this lady I was managing a video store of all things and this little lady came in and she had this was the 80s. She had skin tight guest jeans on and uh, jet black spiky hair, cut real short and spiky with a tail, you know, because that was the thing, this long rat tail down the back. How that ever caught on is beyond me, but it was cool. And these great big white sunglasses and this huge leather bag purse over her shoulder. And she... She came in and asked me for her favorite movie, which was Predator. So I showed her where the movie was, and as I was checking her out, I don't know how, but we got to talking. And she told me she was an artist. And I and I was fascinated with her. She was so adorable. Oh, P.S., skin-tight guest jeans, black spiked hair, tail. She was 70, late 60s, early 70s not quite 70, late 60s. I just thought she was adorable. She pulled out the stack of photographs. Again, pre-internet, so we still printed pictures and had them printed. We didn't print them. Somebody else printed them and mailed them to us or we picked them up at the drugstore. Anyway, she had dozens of pictures of her artwork because she was in all kinds of art shows and whatnot, and she just carried these around with her. Anyway, some of her work was photorealistic. Well, now I, I was just hooked. So I'm flipping through these pictures, and she has photorealistic watercolors of her cats lying in the sun and some landscapes and some marbles, and they were, they were fantastic. But as I'm flipping through... Oh, bam, there's an abstract painting. What? What are you doing that for if you can do the other? And then there was something in between. You know, a lot of watercolors are sort of realistic, but kind of watercolory, and there was a lot of that. Uh, she had some pastel sketches. She had just oodles and oodles of different things. Some collage, some great big monstrous three-dimensional collages and oh I was just taken with her and we struck up a friendship and she became quite a mentor of mine and that night 
I went home and I painted. I went up in the attic and I pulled all my art stuff out, what I had left. And I, I remember it was an old Frederick's canvas, probably from Ben Franklin, just a little canvas. And I think, it, I don't even remember what kind of, I know they were paints and tubes. I don't think it was watercolor. It might have been, I don't know. But I painted an iris. First time I'd had my art supplies out in probably six or seven years. And um, that started the next, the painting phase. And she had such a, on one hand, fantastic story. On the other hand, quite a sad story in that she'd always wanted to be an artist. And I remember this was the 80s and she was almost 70. So when she was growing up, her options were be a wife and mother, be a secretary, a nurse, or a teacher. You can't be an artist. There's no money in artists. You can't raise a family on being an artist. You can't, you can't, you can't. So she got married. She had a few kids, and she got a job at a grocery store. And she worked at that grocery store until she retired. Now, again, you have to... Things are very different now with the internet. Every, the internet changed everything. She didn't have access like we have access now. And so she just put her nose to the grindstone and she helped support her family. Uh, her husband got sick and she took care of him. And then it became her turn to retire. 62, 65, 65, I think she retired from the grocery store. She worked the grocery store that whole time, I believe. Once she was retired and her time was her own, she'd waited her whole life, her whole life, to do what she wanted to do, and that was be an artist. And holy Hannah, once that barrel was uncorked there was just no stopping her that's why there was collage and there was abstract there was stuff that looked like jackson pollock and there was stuff that looked like george o'keefe and there was three-dimensional stuff and there was photorealism and there were pictures of her cats and landscapes and people and she couldn't stop it i mean it just exploded out of her which is awesome it's heartbreaking that she had to wait her whole life to do that Times have changed, thankfully. And anyway, she opened my eyes and taught me that art is so much more than that. Well, then then I decided I, I was going to go back to my first love and uh, get an MFA in painting, Master's of Fine Arts degree, because I'm, I'm an academic addict. Uh, have been since I was a kid. I loved school when I was a kid. All summer long I played school. Sometimes I was the teacher. Most times I was the teacher. But sometimes I was the student because someone had to do the homework. So it was just me at the cottage <laughs> playing school all summer long <laughs> till it was time to go back to school. So I will forever be grateful for her guidance and her mentorship. She gifted me I was showing some her some of my pictures of my cats, and she saw one of me. I had fallen asleep using one of my cats as a pillow. God love them. And she loved it, and she, she took it and painted it full size, 20, 22 by 30 inch watercolor. And I was sleeping on top of a quilt that one of my grandmothers made me. It looks like my friend cut a piece of that quilt out and glued it on the page. It's so exactly the quilt, which I still have the quilt. You know, it hasn't gone away, but I was so amazed by that. It's not a photorealistic painting, but that quilt part sure looks like material right out of my quilt. She was as creative with her titles as she is with her artwork she called that one catnap 
And it was entered in shows and whatnot, and it was hanging in at least one gallery, one showing, one art show that I that I remember. It's been a long, long time. And I own that. I have that painting, and it's just one of my favorite, favorite things in the whole wide world uh, because it's from her. Anyway, the, the reason I'm sharing all of this long story with you is that art is so much more than than one thing. You know, it's not just photorealism and it's not just watercolor painting. Art is junk journaling and art is glue booking and art is tearing paper and dyeing paper and and it's not just a craft. It's a it's a mindset and it can be a lifestyle and it it can be so many things and it's different for everybody. It's important to keep an open mind not be so hard on yourself or your skills or your supplies or your you're at where you're at you have what you have and you can build from there i am going to let this dry completely i have a couple more things that i want to do to it but it has to be bone dry for that and i don't want to hit it with the dryer so i will come back to this when it is good and ready